Hello and welcome to the Songwriting Podcast, where we build our songwriting muscles together. My name is Eventur Karlsson, and today it is my pleasure to welcome Jody Krangle to the show. Jody has been a voice actor since 2007 and has worked with clients from major brands all over the world, including uh, Dell, BB, VA, and, 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 and Kraft. She's also a singer and put out her own album of jazz, blues, and traditional tunes, which you can find at jodykranglemusic.com. Over the years and doing what she does, she's uh, learned a lot about sound and how it influences people. And uh, she has a podcast on that subject called Audio Branding, The Hidden Gem of Marketing. And I was also very happy to learn that Jody plays Dungeons and Dragons, which is something that I used to do as a teenager and I've been wanting to get back into it. And um, that's been a, uh, a struggle because my kids are too cool for it and all my friends uh, have families and lives and are busy. Uh, what are you going to do? Anyway, I'm a marketing nerd and a nerd in general. And uh, of course, being a songwriter, I'm all about sound and audio. So, I mean, this I can't wait to talk to Jody. But before we do that, I want to remind you of the goal setting workbook that you can get on my website. Now, Without a proper goal setting framework, a goal is just a dream. So it's time to make your songwriting dreams come true. That's why I created a free resource to help songwriters set proper goals. And if you go to songwriting.net slash goals, you can get that free workbook right now. That's songwriting.net slash goals. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. And if you leave a review, that really helps me to reach more people. If you want to support the show, please consider making a donation through songwriting.net slash PayPal. Or you can also help by going through my Amazon link. The next time you feel like Amazon shopping, just go to songwriting.net slash Amazon. And that way, a percentage of your shopping goes to this show. All right. That's enough of that. Uh, Jody Krangle, welcome to the Songwriting Podcast. Hello. Great Hello. to be here. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. I have a soft spot in my heart for songwriters because I had a Muse's Muse songwriting resource for, I don't know, years, 95 till 2016, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. You told me about that. <laughs> yeah. And it's a great, I, and I, I actually uh, was aware of that uh, website. I didn't know you had anything to do with it, but um, yep. yeah, that was, that a, was my was very a cool first site. web endeavor <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> oh, <you> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, uh, welcome and thanks for being here. And first of all, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey and, and so on? Ooh, well, uh, I basically started online as soon as online was a thing. Um, like I said, I had that website started in 95. So yeah. it started as a question and answer, really. It started as a survey that I put up on one HTML page and people would email me their responses and then I would post their responses on that HTML page. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so that's how the whole thing, that's how Muse's Muse started. But uh, it, it grew a lot. Um, it had resources a ton. It had columnists, it had a message board and a, um, a, uh, songwriting spotlights. And it had a radio show for a little while, actually too. Oh, wow. you know, radio muse, <laughs> which cool. was, yeah, like, like 2002. actual airwaves radio. Well, it was, no, it was a uh, internet radio. So do you remember when, okay. um, live 365 was around? Cause this was in real audio. Like it was way back. Okay. Yeah. I have 365. So, was that uh, Microsoft It was Live? an internet radio broadcasting network that anyone could belong to. It was like a service. It was almost like a pod host, okay. like a podcasting host, but they did that for internet radio shows. So you okay. could have that. I, we weren't even on it. It was just the time that that was in. I only had it on the Muse's Muse website. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, we would produce that and and uh, get 12 songwriters together and put a show together based on their music and some commentary and it was a lot of fun. We had a Wow. We had a good time. Yeah, but it was my baby for a really long time. And when I was promoting that website, I was promoting it on a dime. I had no money at all. Yeah. 
And I was currently, um, when I started it, I was actually working a nine to five job. And at that nine to five job, I started learning about internet marketing and um, how to get online in the first place and a little bit of graphic design and all of that kind of stuff. So I put it all to use on the Muse's Muse. And then as that was going, I decided, well, okay, this is a new field. I'll get into it. I'll help other people do what I'm doing. So I did internet marketing and SEO for a while. Um, while I was search engine optimization, just so that people know what that is, SEO. Um, And uh, I was a media buyer for a data recovery company for a little while. And that sort of taught me more. When I went out on my own, that was like 1999, I think, around there. And I was self-employed and I did internet marketing and SEO for clients while also working on the Muse's Muse because that was my baby. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and then uh, 95, 96, I did some volunteer work for the CNIB, um, which is the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. And I was reading uh, magazine articles onto reel to reel tape. <laughs> At the time, it was actually reel to reel tape. Yeah. And I, I loved it. I really enjoyed it a lot. And I didn't really know what voiceover was until then. So that was where the bug bit, but it really took a while for it to percolate in the back of my head because I was doing the internet marketing and the SEO and I was making a okay living, not great, but you know, enough to pay the mortgage and sure. do whatever I needed to do. Um, and I didn't, you know, I was younger. I didn't have all that many needs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't have kids, so that wasn't a concern. Um, I've been married 30 years now plus. <laughs> uh, we were just getting started. And uh, yeah, you can get by with a lot less when you're just getting started. So yeah, um, it wasn't such a big deal. But then in 2007, I got so bored. I just got bored. It, Google was the only game in town. It was just... Like, why? <laughs> yeah. Why was I doing this anymore? <laughs> and and things happen when I get bored. <laughs> mm. So I decided that was the time to go into the internet marketing. Or sorry, the internet marketing. I was, I, I was leaving internet marketing. I decided it was time to go into voiceover. And I right. did all of my research online and met people and got to know the business and made all my big mistakes in the beginning (laughs) Um, and had some very patient people work with me and let me know what was what in the very beginning. (laughs) Um, And uh, yeah, and it it just, it's worked out really, really well to the point where when 2016 came around, um, I really wasn't, I hadn't been writing songs in a long time because I'd been more of a facilitator than a writer. Mm-hmm. And I don't mind that. I, that's, mm-hmm. that's okay. I mean, we all are where we are in our lives and you know, you do what makes you happy. Right. So yeah. I was doing the voiceover and that was feeding all of my creative juices. I kind of didn't need the songwriting anymore, I guess it, it like it, it comes in, you know, creativity is such a weird wonky thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it ebbs and flows depending on where you are in your headspace, I guess. Yeah. And because voiceover was feeding everything for me, I didn't feel the need to keep songwriting. And I was focusing more on the voiceovers. So in 2016, I figured, Hmm, this is not going to become a social media network. That's not what I wanted for it. And mm-hmm. really the only way for a online resource network thing to work nowadays is for it to have that component. And since I didn't really know how to upgrade the Muse's Muse, I just said, okay, maybe it's time to let it go. Cause it wasn't really going anywhere. Um, right. So yeah. Do you need to get that? No, I need to wait for it to pass. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I'm leaving that in, by the way. Um, (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But I I just, uh, I love that line, that uh, that phrase you just said. Um, uh, When I get bored, things happen. (laughs) That's the story of my life. It's like, (laughs) oh. Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll be an author now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But but I have like my my story is kind of uh, a little bit the opposite of 
what you just said. Not that this is about me, but anyway, but it's, you know, I keep, you know, I keep saying, oh, you know, I want to, I want to be a, a marketing professional now. So I'll go and do that. And I'll get a job. And then, but then I always come back to songwriting. You know, it's like coming home for me always. And so now I'm just kind of, no, I'll, I'll just, I, th- I hope I learned my lesson now that this is, I always get sucked back in. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, I mean, that's your creative outlet, right? Yeah. That's, I think there's nothing at all invalid about that. Like, well, no, do your creativity as you need to do it. Yeah. yeah I think yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And, and I've done, you know, I, I, I wrote a novel and I did the audiobook version and I loved doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, you know, but you know, this, uh, it's, this is my passion, you know, oh, but, yeah. um, audio books are a lot of work too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially this, it, it was, <laughs> you know, uh, got into a booth and it was just a, a monitor and a keyboard. And if you made a mistake, you had to edit it out yourself using the keyboard. It was a prehistoric system. Oh, okay. Um, this was in 2007. So I'm, I'm pretty early on. Yeah, yeah. Upgraded since then. But um, a friend of mine was listening to an Icelandic audiobook, and he <laughs> he got this. Uh, he was listening, and this, the guy was reading, you know, blah, 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 reading the story. And then a phone rings on the recording, and he goes, "Hello, yeah, no, I'm just reading a, an audio. Yeah, nope, yeah, all right, yeah, talk later." And then he just kept reading. <laughs> and apparently, he, Are you I kidding? Maybe, he didn't know that he was the one who was responsible for editing that out, <laughs> so oh, no. he was just left in. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's oh my, my favorite goodness. audiobook story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't and do I know the guy books. was reading it also, which is even better. Yeah. I, d- I but, don't do uh, them. I know my limits. <laughs> <laughs> that's but so um, uh, audio branding, I'm fascinated with, and you es- explained to me a little bit about what it was before we, uh, mm-hmm. before we talked, but... Uh, uh, I still don't think I understand it completely, but tell us what is audio branding? Why is it important? What, you know, and who is it for? Uh, and yeah, tell me everything. <laughs> tell you everything. <laughs> yes, right please. Now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Well, I will give you the definition that the International Sound Awards gives because it's a really comprehensive definition and I like to uh, quote it. Uh, It defines audio branding as a brand sound that represents the identity and values of a brand in a distinctive manner. The audio logo, branded functional sounds, brand music, or the brand voice are characteristic elements of audio branding. You can also have the sounds of a car door closing be audio branding because each car has a very specific sound, right? Luxury cars sound different than a Toyota, right? Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) they just, they're all, it's all part and parcel of the identity and the DNA of that company brand and what people can expect just by hearing you when they experience your brand. Right. So, uh, so I'm, I'm guess so, I mean, so it incorporates like, I'm assuming jingles and sure. also, Any music. also voice talent mm-hmm. f- for, for a brand, you know, the, um, uh, you know, like who's, uh, like Brian Cranston is the voice for Ford Motors. Mm-hmm. So that's the audio branding there, a part of it, I guess. Um, all right, but what cool. does so, he make you feel when you hear him? What does he make you feel? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> That's the audio brand, right? That's yeah. what the audio brand does. It makes you right. emotionally connect with the company. Yeah. So I kind of liken this to film in that if you are watching a scary movie or any movie for that matter, if you turn off the sound, you'll get what's going on, but you won't yeah. really care. No. Right? So exactly. the it's the sound, the music, the sound design, the characters speaking, all of that that combines to give you an emotional perspective on what you're watching. And if you don't yeah. have that emotional perspective, it's hard to care. So yeah. that's what audio branding does. It gives you that emotional um, understanding of who the company is and why you should care. <laughs> right, exactly. And and um you know, for uh, for musicians uh, and and songwriters, uh, you know, I'm assuming there are a lot of opportunities out there to, you know, I mean, obviously, actually, in fact, uh, just 
last episode, I had uh, uh, Nick Morrison on on the show, and he was talking about uh, film and TV music, and uh, and and how yeah. you know how, how you can how you can make a make a living as a songwriter or as a composer doing that, and and this is kind of in the same vein, I suppose. Um, and and I'm I'm guessing that you know uh, if because a lot of people that get into uh, writing music for licensing they tend, at least from what i've seen like on on blogs and things they're sort of oh you know you should cover a lot of ground and do you know do a lot of different styles and different genres but i'm assuming that uh and this goes to what nick told me last episode as well is that you know you want to be you don't want to have a niche you want to be you know your you have your sound and do your thing and then you know if somebody's looking for that they'll go to you and i'm assuming that in audio branding that would be a really good thing as well because in, in essence have your audio brand as an artist and then you know have a, a a brand come find that if you, if you want to get into like writing for advertising or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but uh, <laughs> I, I kind of went off on a tangent, but uh, am I on the right track there? Yeah, you're on the right track. I mean, it depends on what you like to do. If you like to do stuff that's broad ranging and, and diversified, then go for it. You know, it you just sure, depends on what kind of a musician you are. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you can do uh, instrumental music, you can do uh, music with a vocal, you can cover some interesting already known tunes that you think you can do an interesting twist on. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of times companies in advertising, um, in advertising and marketing, they will pay for an artist to reimagine a popular song so that they can use the song, but not have to pay the licensing for the performance of that song, which can be really expensive. (laughs) Right. So in a lot of cases, uh, some lesser known, but very good musicians can get on the radar that way. So it's, there's all sorts of opportunities. Um, I actually, I did talk with Nick and um, there's another fellow who I would recommend you talk to. His name is Mac McIntosh. I believe he's in Texas. He's a music licensing guy. He had, he runs music clerk. Um, Okay. So yeah, really interesting service. And uh, he does music licensing. Um, there's there's a bunch of people that I've been talking to on the audio branding podcast about music licensing and how musicians can make a, a living. I actually yeah. have a clubhouse that's coming up on that very subject, and we had one already. So this is the second one, and a lot of the people that I'm mentioning here are going to be on that panel. So oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I have um, clubhouse discussions Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern in my club, which is called The Power of Sound. So we talk about all sorts of things sound-related audio branding, of course, but also music and music licensing and how musicians can do better and um, all sorts of things about podcasting. And uh, we have something coming up about how music can help critically ill and dying patients. Wow. Um, And uh, the sounds in hospitals, the beeps, how they're killing us. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. There's like really interesting topics all about sound. There's so much to explore. So well, it's not. Do they really have? Because yeah. in in Iceland, I've never heard those mm-hmm. beeps anywhere in any hospital. Uh, is that really a thing? Because oh, I see it in TV. Here. I was like, that surely that's just a TV thing. But it's not. Yeah. It's, oh no, wow! Okay. I wish it was. I wish it wow. was. Um, I know that um, there was a children's hospital in Helsinki. I think that got an award for um, best audio from the International Sound Awards about how they sound designed their hospital. So they started off with like soundscapes on each level of the hospital. So you had like ocean and beach and field and forest and sky and space or something like something like that. And, uh, and each floor had a different soundscape for the kids. And how much of a difference do you think that makes for oh, how comfortable someone is when they're in a place they really don't want to be in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's I'm I'm very sensitive to to sounds, and um, you know, we we when we got a, a new TV at one point, we you know our TV broke because a <laughs> a battery flew out of a a, remo- a, a 
a Wii controller and hit the screen. And it, anyway, anyway uh, and we were not like in a place where we could buy a really expensive fancy TV. So we just bought a cheap one and it was fine, except the speakers were horrible. And I couldn't, I couldn't have it on. It just, it hurt my ears so much. Even if it, the volume was low and I was in the next room, I just couldn't do it. It was, there was some frequency in there or something that hurt my ears. So I can totally understand that, yeah. uh, you know, as a musician, a, you'd be really sensitive to that too. Yeah. Even though my hearing is, you know, of, over the years, I've not treated my ears the way I should have. So, you know, um, but uh, you know, uh, like audio branding, that's obviously uh, us as musicians, we're maybe not the people using it, but we are the people producing uh, exactly things for for that. Yeah, um, and it's not for us; it's for right. us to bring to other people. Again, as yeah. a voice actor, same thing. Not for me, but for mm-hmm. me to bring to someone else's brand. Right, and so uh, as as a uh, as a songwriter, as a musician, and uh, you know, and of course. Uh, all, most of us are, you know, we're always looking for ways to, to not only get our music to fans, but also to, you know, uh, expand our possibilities of, of revenue and whatnot and working for other brands. Is there, are there things that uh, songwriters can keep in mind or musicians can keep in mind when, you know, looking to maybe expand uh, you know, if they want to, because I mean, I'm assuming you do consultation work and things for, for brands. Like if I wanted to, I actually don't, you don't. Be, okay. Well, if, honest, if I'm somebody, yeah. you know, if I want to, um, if I want to, you know, make, make, uh, those people who are, you know, more in the business world, notice me, mm-hmm. uh, what are some things that I might need to keep in mind? Um, I would be careful about the views that I express online. <laughs> Right. Because people will not hire people that they think have opposing viewpoints. And so you may as well just not tell them. <laughs> just, I'm just telling you right now. All right. <laughs> and this happens for musicians. It happens for voice actors. It happens for anyone who's getting hired. Just in, you know, when it comes to social media and you're not face to face with someone and you can't explain in a reasonable, logical fashion while you're face to face with someone, just don't. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, that's a career that's career advice for just about anyone. <laughs> right. Well, um, let's talk about sound a little bit. Uh, cause you've, I've, I, you know, when I was doing my research for this interview, I saw a lot of things that you say about sound that just made me uh, perk my ears. Uh, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but uh, you know, you you, you say, you, you, and I, I I mentioned this earlier that you've learned a lot about sound and the ways it influences people, and you know, as musicians, that's you know, we deal in sound. So, uh, can you tell me a little bit about this? Like, is there some way in, in which this relates to to music? Well, I mean, music influences your moods, definitely. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to put a brand on a company or a product or a service or something like that, the music is very important because that's going to let people figure out how they should feel about this product. Right. And there are various tropes that we have throughout the years that, that we've gotten accustomed to, at least in the Western world. So... Um, playing to those tropes can actually work in your favor. If you're talking about, for instance, music for TV and and for advertising, then you do want to uh, emphasize the archetypes because right. those are important and those mm-hmm. are what help the brand or the television show uh, get the audience to understand exactly what's going on in five seconds as opposed yeah. to you know, watching the whole show. Like they don't, this scene needs to give you the impression of what's happening in five seconds. Yeah, You need to know what's going on really fast. And advertising is generally 30 seconds or less these days. And in fact, it can be as low as six seconds. Mm -hmm. So you really want that information to come through fast. Yeah. And playing to those archetypes will really help you out in that way. 
totally. And and you know, I I always I have this um, this theory of how hooks work in songs mm. uh, because I used to be a comedian and um, and uh, I wrote a thesis on jokes and comedy and and I studied joke structure and joke structure jokes work it, it's you know you get set up and punchline and set up the setup leads you in a certain direction it, it makes you expect a certain thing and then the punchline breaks that expectation and a hook to me works the same way in that it it sets up something familiar something that you expect and then it it twists it slightly and that's what makes it stick in your brain. If it's something completely unexpected that you, you've never heard before, it's probably not going to be very catchy. The catchiness comes from something being familiar, but if it's too familiar, then it's going to be boring. And um, so I think, you know, if, if you want to write music that is that works in TV, advertising, film, that sort of stuff, you probably need to think about that even more because, you know, it it, it needs to... Be, oh yeah, I'm looking for that kind of a song for this. It's commercial. like any advertising, right? It needs yeah. to be memorable. If it's exactly. not memorable, it doesn't suit its purpose. So exactly. a song that you can't sing, well, I mean, it's nice to listen to, but yeah. it's not going to be a pop song. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, or I mean, even and that's I mean, not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> No, but, uh, but even I mean, even when you can't sing it, the hook sometimes is the rhythm. Uh, you know, uh, like we will rock you. You know, boom, boom. That's the hook of the song. The melody oh, sure. isn't. Yeah, you yeah. Know, is, that's the yeah. hook. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, you know, and and a lot of like hip hop songs, it's the it's the beats and it's the bass line and things. You know, that makes it stick. And yeah, you know, and that's I think that's why a lot of hip hop works so well is because they take samples of something that you know and they put it to a hip hop beat, so they're juxtaposing the familiar with the unfamiliar, and it makes it really stick in your head. Yeah. In that case, I would say it's the rhythm because the rhythm gets yeah. you moving. The rhythm gets you feeling something. Yeah. You know, so really it is all about emotion and feeling. And if a song doesn't impress you emotionally, you're just not going to remember or care. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, so I, I think, uh, you know, going back to what you said, you know, uh, audio branding is not um, uh, for us so much. But I think that uh, branding for artists is, super important and i think that you know if if one is wanting and this is again I, i'm uh, just spitballing here and you know this is some sort of my feeling but um is that it, it sounds to me like it would be easier to get into this whole you know music licensing whether it's for commercials or or film or tv or whatever by you know having a good sense of who you are as an artist and being true to that there's this great quote that I keep uh, trying to figure out who said, because I heard this. I think it might have been Quincy Jones, but I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, I heard this years and years ago, and it's my favorite quote. And I quote this all the time with the same long story before it, uh, which is, find out who you are and be the shit out of that. And it's that advice. is- Yes, and uh, for any creative person, I think that's... It works know. in voiceover, too. That's exactly what they tell you to do. What they, you know. In yeah. general, if you're going yeah. to make a name for yourself, your brand is what you sound like. Yeah. You know, now you can sort of manipulate that, but generally what you get hired for is your brand. Mm -hmm. So in the case of a musician, it's the same thing. What you get hired for is your brand. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to get hired for that, then you got to change your music. <laughs> yeah. And I always tell songwriters this because a lot of songwriters struggle with uh, their, their confidence and they, they have self doubt and that, and I've certainly uh, gone through huge uh, battles with that myself. And what I always tell people is, you know, don't try to be somebody else. Just be you because, you know, you, you, sure you can be a, subpar version of Bruce Springsteen or you can be an awesome version of you and which one is better you know that's pretty obvious yeah. I think yeah we need more originality but it's also about being um vulnerable and it's being yeah. more relatable 
and um, and authenticity, which is so important exactly. right now. You I know, if you're going to do anything, important. do it as you, because then you know you're really getting the success as you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and of course, you know, branding is about consistency and it's about all of those things. But I think uh, most of all, it needs to be like authentic because people will see right through it every time if, if it's not. Um, you said something on your, uh, where I was, you know, there's a thing that you said somewhere and I have to ask you about <laughs> Probably this. my said, media kit page. Yeah. <laughs> did, well, yeah. Uh, did you know that you can influence what you taste by what you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really fun discussion that I had with Steve Keller, who is the Sonic Strategy Director over at SXM Media. So that's Sirius XM and Pandora and uh, Stitcher, I think. And there's wow, probably yeah. a bunch of other stuff there. He works with an advertising agency within that called Studio Resonate. And Studio Resonate is doing all sorts of really innovative stuff, including sonic diversity. So we get to hear more than just white voices, which is, mm -hmm. I think, a long time coming and should yeah. be done way more than it is. Um, and uh, he, back in the before times, <laughs> before the <laughs> pandemic, yeah. um, they had a... Um, a promotion for Propel, which is like a Gatorade kind of drink in the US. And they had these DJ stations set up where people would listen to a sound or music in headphones. And then they had an iPad and they could dial in how much salty or sweet they wanted to taste with the Propel drink that they had in their hand. So they could listen and then dial in whether they wanted it more sweet and then take a drink and then make it more salty and take a drink. And it actually tasted different. So he and the people over there had been innovating ways to sort of get your brain working together, all your senses working together in a way that the combo of the screen that you were seeing, which was going from color to black and white, or and and also the sounds that you were hearing and then what you were tasting and it all going together it actually did influence what you tasted and you can do s things like that in restaurants um you can make someone experience more crunch for instance if they're having a particular um type of meal that requires that like a you know deep fried something or whatever i don't know like calamari or whatever <laughs> yeah. um and uh, you can you can influence what people taste and how they experience the space by what they're hearing. It's just it's such an um, unexplored yet uh, important um, type of experiment. And we are only just learning how this works. Our brains are very strange. <laughs> yes. Oh my! This I'm. You know I'm not. Um... I'm I'm not I'm pretty much just an Americana guy, but you know now I just want to uh, start a, a <laughs> an art group where it's like visual and and audio and and taste. That's just all I want to do right now. They did <sighs> um they did an experiment with a beer actually, and I can't remember if I think it might have been a German beer. Um, but they were experimenting with the DJ making sounds that made you experience more or less bitterness in the beer. And, and that was an interesting one as well. So there's all sorts of these experiments going on right now, and there are only more coming. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's incredible to me as, as you know, and, and I think, uh, uh, this, this feels like a, uh, uh, an added dimension to you know when when you're producing producing an album and you're going well do we want the album to be salty or sweet <laughs> well but you can also think about like would someone play this in a french restaurant while they're having yeah. a nice meal or would they play this in the pub while they're having a beer you know like <laughs> yeah these are these are things you can think about because you are creating an environment for people to experience life in and I yeah. think that that's really an important thing or another dimension to look into when you're writing your music. And this is actually something that I've probably never thought about, um, at least not very consciously, uh, that that is, you know, because you, you work with, 
you know, uh, uh, the audio branding and all that, you know, so, and, and we're kind of talking from the other side of the table now, uh, as a musician. And I think maybe, um, you know, we need to spend more, well, not need to, but it probably would be, uh, wouldn't be a bad idea for songwriters when we're producing our, uh, work to think more about, like where are people going to listen to this and how do I want them to feel when they do? Yeah, you um, can certainly think about that. I wouldn't want musicians to change the entire way that they write their songs based on that because that then takes away from the authenticity. I mean, still be you. <laughs> no, but, yeah, of course. Yeah, but but it does lend a, an interesting facet to the creation of music that I mm -hmm. think people could stand to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I, I'm wrong. I have thought about it, but in the other, I, like, um, after the fact, like I've, I've, you know, I've taken my albums and said, where do we, and actually I, I asked a couple of people like, what do you, you know, wh what does this bring to mind? And, and I kind of, uh, had in mind like, oh yeah, no, it's, it's like people sitting in a coffee shop. That's where, you know, that's where you're like, um, which would work. But, um, actually what I, the, 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 the uh, feeling that I ended up with was more, you know, listening to a vinyl record in front of a fireplace while drinking hot chocolate kind of a thing, sure. um, uh, which is, of course, the best. And so that's, you know, and so I guess what I took from that was when I was um, creating the copy, because I like to sell my albums, which I noticed you do too. You're, uh, when I went on your music website, it was like, buy this album. And I was like, yes, people People still buy albums, and you should encourage them to do so. Um, I'm just old. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, that's my hangup. <laughs> listen, I have uh, I I have like six songs on streaming platforms or whatever, and I write a lot of songs. I have hundreds of the things, um, but I sell music, and I've made I, I've made way more money from selling albums than I ever would from uh streaming oh yeah because streaming pays you cents on the dollar i mean it's, it's not a good proposition for any musician really no no it's it's really not and and but you know i i i don't i don't complain about it to me spotify and all of those platforms they have their use they're good for discoverability and things like that uh, but I'm not because I don't want to be one of those musicians who goes around whining about how little they get paid from streaming platforms. I'm just not using them. That's just, that's the thing. I just, it's, well, I mean, I'm using them, but in, in, you know, in a limited capacity and, you know, not expecting to make money off of them because that's not what they're good for, for 99% of musicians. Yeah. Um, well, that's why we have these discussions about how musicians can make money. <laughs> exactly. Because, yeah, because the, the Spotify's of the world are not going to help. <laughs> no, exactly. And, uh, but what I was going to say was uh, when I, you know, when I sort of figured out, oh, yeah, no, this is the soundscape. This is, this is like you're in your cottage in the mountains and there's snow outside and that's where you listen to my album and so that influenced my marketing of that album it was like okay so that's the feeling so all the all the copy the uh, the text that i wrote to promote it and 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 all of that stuff and like all the stock photos that i got together to put on on websites and things it was you know instead of being like me on a stage with a guitar which i have in there as well but it was also like fluffy slippers and and uh, blankets and like it's it's and i and i uh i came up with the term comfort food for your ears which was um i love it that's a good <laughs> yeah. one yeah yeah so uh so there i guess that is kind of uh doing branding for the audio but it would then work in the other uh, work the other way as well and um you know, not to put the cart before the horse, but you you could also, again, if if you want to, which I, that's you know what I'm you know, and I'm I'm always I use this podcast as kind of just in a selfish way to learn for me, and hopefully others <laughs> get benefit from it as well. But uh, you know, talking to Nick and now talking to you, I'm you know I'm planning to get into music licensing, and so you know, in terms of like writing something that you want to for like quote unquote the explicit uh purpose of getting used in TV or commercials or whatever then i suppose that would be a good 
place to start. Like, okay, I need, obviously writing from me, from my style, being true to myself, like what would I write to, uh, you know, to in, invoke this feeling? Like what do I, to invoke happiness or to invoke melancholy yeah. or whatever? I would actually go so far as to say, write for the situation. So yeah. if you're in a car and you're taking a long trip, what's the sound? What's the right. song? Yeah. Right? If you're having a romantic dinner, what's the song? If you're sitting on a hilltop watching a sunrise, what's the song? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that kind of feeling, because in directories, they're going to generally split them up by the emotions that they evoke. So yeah. joy, uh, fun, uh, craziness, um, mm -hmm. rock, you know, like, uh, uh, grunge, you know, like there's also sure. like, like these feelings, right. Mm -hmm. Um, like rock and grunge are genres as well, but they're also like, you know, like heavy feelings or, yeah. um, cool or, um, you know, urban or, um, you know, uh, uh, environments that are warm and welcoming or, um, a little childish or, you know, that kind of Disney-esque, right? Like sure. there's all sorts of like different, different emotions that you could search for, mm -hmm. um, exotic or, mm -hmm. um, whimsical, it's one whimsical. Of my that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, all sorts of ones. Like, um, for instance, like if you're watching something about Egypt on the history channel, what would the music be for that? You know what I mean? Like I just wrote uh background music for an Egyptian funeral for a, a play I'm working on. Well, there you which, go. Right. Uh, yeah. It doesn't sound Egyptian at all, but uh, it was, be it, it was very difficult because I had to use, well, not had to use, but I, I wanted to use the main theme from the play, which is not in a scale that lends itself to Egypt. So I just basically I, I did something around that with a lot of Middle Eastern uh, instruments, and yeah. uh, it works I mean, for the if, scene, so it, it's fine. If it has that feel, exactly, yeah. So yeah, I would think it's it's emotional context. Like I said, it's right. The music is emotional context for the video yeah. that you're watching. So think of it as that emotional context, and and sort of like build the scene in your head while you're composing, and then you're likely to get a lot of really good hits on a directory like like the one that Nick was talking about. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I, and I, I suppose, I, do you have experience working with those directories? Uh, I do. Um, what happens for me is I use them a lot um, just to get my emotional well-being into where I'm in with my voice acting. So oh, wow. if I need to evoke whimsical if I need to evoke exotic or um, awe-filled or, you know, um, mysterious, you know, that kind right. of thing, I'll yeah. listen to a particular piece of music that I found on a music directory and I'll let that evoke the emotion for me and then I'll speak. And then cool. that lends itself very much more to what might be used in whatever thing I'm auditioning for. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, if, if the client has music already for what they're going to be putting out there on video, oh my God, is that a game changer for me? If wow, I can listen yeah. to the music while I'm speaking or, yeah. or even before I'm speaking and keep that in my mind when I'm mm -hmm. speaking their, their script. Oh, like that's just, that's, that's wonderful. That's just, that's, mwah. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty awesome. I, uh. And I, I, it makes so much sense. I, I never, uh, I never really thought of that, like in terms of voice acting, but it, it makes total sense um, because music, obviously, as we all know, it influences your mood so much. And you know, and and it's so interesting that there are there's music that you would never listen to uh, outside of certain contexts, right? Like if you're going to work out then you're probably going to listen to music that you would rarely listen to outside of that. I mean, it's, I'm not a big heavy metal fan, but when I, if I want to go lift weights, like really heavy weights, I'll listen to death metal because it just, it, it gets, that me makes a lot the, of sense in the right mood. Yeah. For um, me, it's queen. Don't stop me now. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm the biggest queen fan. I'll <laughs> listen queen. to queen uh, under any circumstances. Yes. I don't care. How, what did you think of the movie? Sorry? What, what did uh, I think? What, of the movie. 
Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, I honestly, I couldn't bring myself to watch it. I I oh. tried and um, I know it's good and it's not that I'm making any comment on it being good or bad or anything. Um, right. I just found it really hard knowing where it was ending up. <laughs> um, I, right. I, I had a hard time sitting down for that, let's just say. Right. Well, it's, you know, people say a lot of things. It's It's not, it's not a documentary. Let's just put it like that. It's not, you know. Okay. Um, but it's it's. But I and I find I went to the uh, cinema and I said we still have intermission at the movies, um, which is a weird thing. But I, I did I was see Rocket like, Man. That was one thing that you know. I didn't see that. Yeah. See, there, um, there you go. <laughs> kind of so, the yeah, opposite. But yeah. <laughs> but I kind of like at intermission. I was like, none of this is like the uh, order of things happen. This is all like the songs are from different and and everything. Being the massive Queen fan that I am, I was like, oh, no, that's wrong. But then I was like, okay, settle down. This is a fictionalized account. Enjoy it for what it is. And I loved it. And I, I watch it now regularly. Um, <clears throat> okay, I, I watched it on watch it uh, I watched it on uh, Christmas Day last. That was the last time I watched it. And I still enjoy it. I know where I can watch it, so I will have to do that. Yeah. Um, just, uh, I, I want to pivot a little bit, um, because, uh, you, you work with, uh, I guess people from a lot of different disciplines and, um, and in, in a lot of, you know, uh, person to person, um, uh, uh, work and, and I'm assuming that you need to do a lot of networking. And, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, cause that's another thing that I, uh, that I'm not the best at. Uh, and, uh, I saw that, uh, you, you do talk about like being an introvert and a business owner and to me, I mean that, and that's me, I am a, an introvert and a business owner and I, uh, I'm trying to be better at networking, but it's not, you know, it's, I'm, it's hard. So at, can you talk to me a little bit about being an introvert and a business owner? Well, first of all, I will say that being an introvert doesn't mean you have to be shy. So right. I do, I am an introvert and that's how I regain my energy by mm -hmm. being in peace and quiet, not by being with people. So really right. for me, introversion, extroversion is all about how you regain your energy. Oh, so yeah. I start out with a certain amount of, let's call them credits in a day. Right. And as I go through the day, I give out those credits. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm out of credits, I need to sit down somewhere and just have peace and quiet and replenish my credits. <laughs> sure. And when you're talking to an extrovert, generally those type of people, they don't start out with any credits at all. They get their credits by speaking with other people, right? Oh, yeah. Being in group situations, being out there, um, oh my God, I feel so bad for those people in this pandemic because wow, like it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I it's it's all about how you regain or keep your energy. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, it's um it's it's an interesting aspect. And I think that people when they hear the word introversion, they automatically go to shy. And right. that's not the case for me. I mean, I can be on a podcast in, sure. in a hot second and love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but after this, I'm going to need some alone time. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as networking is concerned, that's a tricky subject because I think that a lot of people go into networking thinking, oh, I need to give them my card or my contact information, or yeah. I need to talk and tell them about what I'm doing. I think that that's the wrong way to look at it. And mm -hmm. um, and I've I've been reading a, a book that's coming out by a fellow that I admire. His name is Vincent Puglisi. And he has something called the Total Life Freedom Podcast. And if you haven't listened to it, I really highly suggest it. Oh, um, and he talked about um, an aspect of networking that really hit me hard. And that was that it should be a way for you to be curious not necessarily a way for you to, you know, verbally vomit everything about you. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so if you are asking someone what their goals are and who they are, 
and being interested in what they do and having a good conversation, then they'll want to know more about you. That's yeah. just that's just how it's going to go. But you're giving first. Yeah. So if you give first, then then people want to give back. That's human nature. Yep. And it's it feels better to give first. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. I mean Yes. I mean, of course. Yeah. And th- this is this goes back to something that I always, you know, I'm always uh, all about um you know, uh, uh, providing value to the people around you and sharing. And, and I always think that, you know, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's, uh, you know, music or business or, uh, just human relationships, if, if you come, if you approach it from a giving perspective, then you're going to get a lot back. And that's always been my, you know, and so I, I always try to, you know, help as much and give as much as I can. And so far it's, it's worked out pretty well for me. And, and yeah, and I think that's a, that's actually a great point that, uh, and, and I, and I don't, uh, I don't equate, uh, introversion with shyness necessarily, but, but to me, uh, because I'm, I'm pretty introverted, I can go on stage and do a lot of things in front of people. That's fine. But one-on-one is a lot harder for me than being in front of a group. You know what I mean? Uh, but you know, uh, this has been great. I, I, you, you have to tell me about your Dungeons and Dragons stuff before we, before we say goodbye. Um, I don't know if you can hear that. No, I can't hear anything. No, you're not hearing anything. No. Okay. That's good. Cause they're like, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing next door. They're like drilling. <laughs> it's like this high <laughs> pitched like squeal. <laughs> okay. This has been like a comedy of errors today. I am so sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm picturing, um, uh, I, I'm just hearing that Tom Waits uh, piece in my head. Like, What's he building in there? What the hell is he building in there? I know they're building something big out. I don't know what they're doing there. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, Yeah. I play on every Tuesday night with a group of um, LA actors and me, (laughs) which is kind of ridiculous, but they're lovely people. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And uh, and, uh, they're called Diced Thespians and they're all really super talented. And um, I'm just trying to keep up. <laughs> but they're lovely people and we have a lot of fun. And uh, the uh, people running the games, the, the GM, um, uh, Tanya Gren is her name. And she tells a really, really wonderful story. She's a, a screenwriter. Oh, and cool. I think she's done some directing as well. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm it is so a lot jealous. of fun. Yeah. I'm, I just, I'm always... I have a stack of D and D books on my shelf, like a, a massive um, one. I got to tell you, my like right over here, I have a whole shelf. <laughs> it's like floor, floor yeah. to ceiling, a shelf of books, and then another one downstairs. <laughs> and my dice collection is in a tackle box that is like Uh-oh. this big. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing, I, I, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna pick up these books and I'm gonna get back into this. I, you know, it's been, it's been, uh, however, like 25 years or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do this. And I, 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 I never used to uh, be a, a dungeon master back, uh, back then. But I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll figure out how to do that. And I watched YouTube videos with tips and things about how to do that, and um, got all this stuff together. And then I, I like got my my kids and i was like come on let's let's play a game and they were so bored <laughs> they were like oh, can we no. never please never do that again and i was like oh my god well i, oh. I probably I, it was probably my fault i probably was pretty bad at it uh and they they weren't very patient um it was a couple of years ago so maybe i'll uh, i'll either have to give it another shot or to sell those books because they depress me now when I look at them. I'm like, oh. Well, I mean, the thing about this whole pandemic, which, you know, not a good thing in general, obviously. No. But it has done something for the online world that um, had not been done before. And that is that you can really do anything from anywhere now. So if you wanted to join a group of players from where you are, I mean, depending on the time difference, that's really going to be the big thing. 
Um, yes. <laughs> but if you could arrange where you are, a bunch sure. of remote players to get together to play a game on a Saturday or something like that, or, or a Tuesday yeah, yeah. night if you wanted. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course, of course. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it just all comes down to time, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it totally does. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, For me, it, it helps actually with the, with the improv, actually. Yeah. I find that it helps a lot for my voice acting to be able to think on my feet as the character that that's helpful oh, yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally get that. Well, um, this has been wonderful. Uh, uh, great talk. Uh, before we leave, uh, tell people, uh, about more about what you do and where they can find you. <laughs> well, I am a voice actor. That is what I do. So if you're interested in uh, anything voice acting related or in hiring me as a voice actor, which of course you're welcome to do, uh, that is at voiceoversandvocals.com. If you're interested in the audio branding podcast, that is at audiobrandingpodcast.com. And if you're interested in the power of sound on Clubhouse, that happens every Wednesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, just for an hour. And uh, we talk about all things sound, uh, podcasting, music, uh, storytelling, public speaking, voiceovers, um, all sorts of different things. And voice AI, um, uh, audio NFTs. I mean, we've talked about all sorts of really interesting things. (laughs) It's awesome. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, we all love sound. And uh, this is uh, uh, fascinating. It's a passion. uh, (laughs) Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, Thank you. uh, uh, Yeah, see you soon. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.